Whoa! Hello there everyone, it's me, Soap's Notes, and I am drinking some coffee. Okay, I'm not actually, because it's 8pm and I really don't want to play with fire like that. But there has been a lot of chat about coffee on technology networks this month. Adam and Tiffany did a Facebook Live on the Neuroscience page, and Rory wrote a really interesting article. I'll link them both below. This, I imagine, is at least partly inspired by the fact that the 1st of October was International Coffee Day. Start the month with coffee and end it with coffins, I guess. And many people seem pretty obsessed with coffee right now. The phrase, I can't get started without a coffee, is basically a standard morning greeting. And as I mentioned in my sleep rhythms video, it's almost trendy to hijack your natural rhythms using caffeine. But here's a confession from me, and maybe it'll make me uncool in the coffee world, uh, but I, I just don't drink much coffee. And so when I do, it has a massive effect on me. Not long ago, I was on an early morning train journey and I got a small latte. It wasn't that small, it was more like that small. And when I drank it and then halfway through the journey, I had to go into the, the train's bathroom and just dance to let off some of the caffeine energy that I now had. And this relationship with coffee, or more specifically caffeine, means I'm very aware of its status as, well, a drug. Caffeine is thought to be the most consumed psychoactive substance in the world. A psychoactive substance being a thing that affects your mind. But I feel like a lot of people don't consider it a drug. At least not in the same way that you'd consider cocaine a drug, or cannabis a drug. But how similar is it to these two? How does coffee compare to cocaine and cannabis? Let's find out. Firstly, coffee versus cocaine. In basic terms, your brain's activity is all down to two things, chemicals and receptors. The general rule of thumb is that certain chemicals will get released and then specific receptors will detect them. That then makes stuff happen depending on what the chemicals are and where they're interacting. Simple. So when any drug affects you, it's affecting the interactions between chemicals and their relevant receptors. Caffeine and cocaine, on first impressions, work very differently. Caffeine blocks the chemical adenosine from interacting with its receptor. Adenosine makes you feel sleepy, and so blocking it stops you from feeling sleepy. Cocaine, on the other hand, influences the activity of a chemical called dopamine. Normally, when dopamine is released in your brain, it eventually gets taken back up again, meaning its effects die down. However, cocaine stops that reuptake of dopamine, forcing it to hang about in your brain for a bit longer, and therefore prolonging the feelings of euphoria and focus that dopamine's associated with. So those two sound like pretty different mechanisms. However, in reality, caffeine is more than just a one chemical kind of drug. Not only does it affect adenosine, but its interactions with adenosine receptors then have a knock-on effect on dopamine. Caffeine, like cocaine, also raises dopamine levels, just on a much smaller scale. Not only does this lead to less intense, but still noticeable, increased alertness and satisfaction, but dopamine also controls the addictive properties of both drugs. It interacts with the reward pathways in your brain. In other words, the processes that make you decide that you want more of something. And the level of dopamine release is reflected in the addictiveness of both the drugs. Cocaine induces an almost brutal increase in dopamine, which can lead to intense addiction. Whereas caffeine isn't quite as addictive because it only has a milder increase. And in this regard at least, caffeine's effects make it kinda like cocaine junior. So although they're both stimulants, caffeine and cocaine primarily affect different chemicals in the brain those being adenosine and dopamine, respectively. That being said, caffeine does have a kind of second-hand effect on dopamine, which could explain some similarities between the two drugs. So if caffeine and cocaine are similar in some ways, how might caffeine compare to a different drug? Coffee versus cannabis. Any tourist who's been to an Amsterdam coffee shop might say, coffee and cannabis, they're the same thing, but they're not. All the effects that cannabis has on your body are mediated by, say it with me, chemicals. Genuinely, we're all just lumps of like chemicals, electricity, and cells, with the electricity being controlled by chemicals and the cells ultimately just being piles of chemicals. Don't think about it too much, you might have an existential crisis. Cannabis acts on your body through a family of chemicals called cannabinoids. It's kind of in the name. You might also hear the phrase endocannabinoids, but they're just cannabinoids that have been made in your body. Endocannabinoids. No, that doesn't mean your body is a cannabis factory. Endocannabinoids are natural chemicals within themselves that interact with your body in different but overlapping ways compared to plant cannabinoids. 
So endocannabinoids come from within and cannabinoids come from some external source like, I don't know, cannabis. Endocannabinoids and cannabinoids and the relevant receptors all come together in a system known as the endocannabinoid system. Again, it's just called endo because it's inside your body. The endocannabinoid system is implicated as having roles in all sorts of bodily functions, from mood to movement, from pain sensation to appetite, which is the same as mood in my opinion. This broad range of roles explains the wide ranging effects of cannabis, from feeling high to feeling hungry to everything in between. The endocannabinoid system is super complex and so are the effects of cannabis. But does coffee have an effect on the endocannabinoid system? Well, yes, yes it does. As Rory discussed in his article, a study led by Marilyn Cornelis at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University, that's in Illinois, by the way, not the Northwest of England, investigated how coffee consumption affects the levels of different chemicals in our bodies. And this study really pushed people's caffeine intake, starting them on four cups of coffee a day for a month, and then pushing them to eight cups a day for another month. That genuinely terrifies me. Just picturing one latte Sophie having seven more coffees is, is frightening. But anyway, one of the most interesting findings of this study was that coffee consumption seemed to lead to a decreased level of endocannabinoids in the blood. Now seeing a smoke in cannabis leads to an increased level of cannabinoids in the blood, and this is thought in some cases to have a knock-on effect and lead to increased level of endocannabinoids in the blood, then the study broadly suggests that coffee opposes cannabis's effects. In reality, it's a bit more complicated than that, with different endocannabinoid and cannabinoid chemicals having different effects on your body. But the findings could mean that coffee could be used to modulate and control certain effects of cannabis. And that's a particularly interesting prospect when it comes to using cannabis for medical use. For example, imagine if drinking coffee could reduce endocannabinoid levels in such a way that negative effects of cannabis were dampened, but therapeutic effects remained in place. This is just me wondering and hypothesizing, like we're not actually sure yet how smoking cannabis and drinking coffee at the same time would interact in psychoactive terms. But nevertheless, the overlap of coffee and cannabis and the endocannabinoid system does lead to some interesting questions. Maybe we should study it in one of those coffee shops I mentioned earlier. But other than leading to kind of coffee cannabis crossover questions, this finding could also hint to why coffee is associated with so many health benefits and health problems. Because I mean, just one quick Google of how does coffee affect the body leads to this whole mass of complicated and contradictory results. It can lead to longer life. It can lead to death. It can lead to a load of health benefits. It causes many health issues. Who knows what to believe? But seeing as I said the endocannabinoid system is a wide ranging and complicated one, maybe that could help to explain the complicated picture of coffee that we've got in front of us. For example, amongst many things, coffee has been related to weight loss. And maybe that's related to the endocannabinoid system's effect on appetite. It would make sense in an opposite of cannabis world, right? Cannabis gives you munchies, coffee reduces your appetite. And the great thing about Marilyn Cornelis' study is that rather than giving us some vague correlation between coffee and a health dream or a health disaster, she's actually giving us an all-important middleman a potential chemical cause. However, even with this potential chemical cause, there's still a heck of a lot of research to be done. And it's a complicated area of study, not just coffee, not just cannabis, but people in general. We are all individually different. And maybe that's why these coffee causes stories that we're chasing are so hard to pin down because we're, we're individuals, and so our genetics and all sorts might change how we react to things. Individual differences between people are so important to bear in mind in scientific studies. By their very nature, scientific studies have to take big groups of people and treat them as if they're all the same in order to get enough data and enough statistical significance. But how similar are we, really? And on that slightly frustrating note, I imagine, oh, we're all just too different to understand what we really are. Uh, but uh, that's the end of the video. <laughs> to summarise, caffeine in coffee is more similar to cocaine than it is to cannabis, giving you a little boost of focus and reward in the form of dopamine, but reducing the levels of endocannabinoids in your system. If you want to read more about Marilyn Cornelis' study, then I do thoroughly suggest reading Rory's article, which, as I said, should be linked below. Thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, then why not check out my YouTube channel, Soph's Notes. I post videos on there about the bits of human biology and psychology that I find interesting. 
and that I find time to film. Tweet me if you want, at Soph's Notes, and all that's left to say is have a lovely day, and remember to keep asking questions.